Well, hi there and welcome to our Bible study on the Book of Corinthians or Books of Corinthians on the Lighthouse Discord server. We're still on chapter three of First Corinthians, but we will be finishing it today. Before we begin, let's open with a word of prayer. Father, we give you thanks and praise that we can gather together in your name and study your word. We give you thanks and praise that you've made your word available to us. We thank you, Lord, that you spoke through these authors, that we would have your word, that we would learn about you, that we would be able to draw close to you. And I pray, Father, that as we study 1 Corinthians 3, or the rest of it, that you would speak into our hearts and minds. Open our ears, open our hearts, open our minds to receive the words that you have for us today. For every need represented on the lighthouse, we ask, Lord, for your intervention, for your provision. We ask, Lord God, that all things would be done according to your will and your way, and that you would be blessed and encouraged by all of our efforts. We thank you and praise you in Jesus' holy name. Amen. So we're going to read all of 1 Corinthians chapter 3, but we're actually starting our study at verse 8. But it's the foundations for living. And I, brethren, could not speak to you as to spiritual men, but as to men of flesh, as to infants in Christ. I gave you milk to drink, not solid food, for you were not yet able to receive it. Indeed, even now you are not yet able, for you are still fleshly. For since there is jealousy and strife among you, are you not fleshly, and are you not walking like mere men? For when one says, I am a Paul, and another, I am of Apollos, are you not mere men? What then is Apollos? And what then, or in what is Paul? Servants through whom you believed, even as the Lord gave opportunity to each one. I planted, Apollos watered, but God was causing the growth. So then neither the one who plants nor the one who waters is anything, but God who causes the growth. And now we get into verse 8. Now he who plants and he who waters are one. But each will receive his own reward according to his own labor. For we are God's fellow workers. You are God's field, God's building. According to the grace of God, which was given to me, like a wise master builder, I laid a foundation. And another is building on it. But each man must be careful how he builds on it. For no man can lay a foundation other than the one which is laid which is Christ Jesus. Now, if any man builds on the foundation with gold, silver, precious stones, wood, hay, straw, each man's work will become evident, for the day will show it because it is to be revealed with fire, and the fire itself will test the quality of each man's work. If any man's work, which he has built on it, remains, he will receive a reward. If any man's work is burned up, he will suffer loss, but he himself will be saved, yet so as through fire. Do you not know that you are a temple of God and that the Spirit of God dwells in you? If any man destroys the temple of God, God will destroy him, for the temple of God is holy, and that is what you are. Let mo no man deceive himself. If any man among you thinks that he is wise in this age, he must become foolish so that he may become wise. Apologies for that. We'll continue at verse 19. For the wisdom of this world is foolishness before God. For it is written, he is the one who catches the wise in their craftiness. And again, the Lord knows the reasonings of the wise, that they are useless. So then, let no one boast in men. 
for all things belong to you, whether Paul or Apollos or Cephas or the world, world or life or death or things present or things to come, all things belong to you. And you belong to Christ, and Christ belongs to God. May God add his blessing to the reading of his word. So we're going back now to verse 8. And the commentary we've been using is called the Smart Guide to the Bible series, part of its first and second Corinthians, and it's written by Dewey Bertolini. So Literary purists generally stay away from mixed metaphors, but Paul uses them to great effect in this section of scripture. <clears throat> and last time we met, we talked about carnal Christianity. And now we get into laying the foundation of our faith. You see, here, Paul likens the church in Corinth both to a plant and to a building. So if we picture the church as a plant, Corinth represented the field into which God called Paul to labor. So we're going to kind of look at this metaphor for a minute. Paul found in Corinth a corrupt culture of darkness, desperately in need of the light of the gospel. Now the gospel is the seed of eternal life, which Paul planted in, quite honestly, what had become a moral wasteland. And as we read in the last section, Paul metaphorically planted the seed as the pioneer missionary who first brought the gospel message to Corinth. And his fellow laborer, Apollos, watered the seed with his teaching ministry. We could look at Acts 18 verse 25 for that. So if we conceive of the church as a building for a moment, Paul thought of himself as a master builder, someone who both designed the building and did some of the work of construction. And he describes his role as laying the foundation, which was an 18 month process during which he systematically taught the people about Jesus Christ, the true foundation of the church. And as he penned this portion of scripture, he might have had in mind Jesus' words to Peter in Matthew 16, 18. I also say to you that you are Peter, a name, by the way, that means a small stone. And on this rock, that is a huge rock of Gibraltar type rock, a reference to Peter's exclamation that Jesus is the Christ, the son of the living God. I will build my church. So this bit of a play on words was meant to underscore the fact that the church rests securely, unshakably upon Jesus, not upon any human being, not even one as notable as Peter. You see, the church of Jesus Christ is not built on fallible men, not Paul, not Apollos, not Peter, nor anybody else, by the way. The church of Jesus Christ is built on the firm foundation of Jesus. So the imagery that Paul uses in these verses would have been abundantly familiar to his Corinthian readers because it was a custom during the Isthmian Games, I-S-T-H-M-I-A-N, Isthmian. I can't say that very well, but that's how you spell it. And these games for winning athletes to receive their crowns on an elevated platform in the middle of the city, much as Olympic athletes today receive their medals on just a platform. Called the Bema, B-E-M-A, in 2 Corinthians 5.10, we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ, that each one may receive the things done in the body according to what he has done, whether good or bad. You see, we'll each mount the steps of the bema 
and stand before our Lord to give an account for the way in which we discharge our God-given duties, a judgment seat in which we will be given our rewards, not punishment. You see, there's no punishment for us to receive since Christ received our punishment in our place on the cross. But I am still personally of the opinion and belief that we still need to repent of our sins. Yes, we repented in the beginning when we first received Christ. But when we sin and do something that is outside the will of God, that is outside of scripture. And we all know what those things mean. And I'm not pointing my finger at anybody or anything, but we know sex outside of marriage, stealing, um, overabundance use of alcohol, or murder, you know, anything that goes against scripture, we need to ask the Lord to forgive us. So when we get to 2 Corinthians 5, we'll learn a little more about this, but we need to know that there was such a Bema seat in Corinth. And Paul himself stood on the Bema in Acts 18, verses 12 and 13, where we read, when Gallio was proconsul of Achaia, the Jews with one accord rose up against Paul and brought him to the judgment or Bema seat, saying, this fellow persuades men to worship God contrary to the law. And on that sad occasion, Paul was on trial for his life with punishment, not reward as the aim. And years later, as Paul penned 1 Corinthians 3, he actually envisioned a coming day when he would stand on a similar seat, this time before the Lord to receive not punishment, but reward. And at the end of his life, <clears throat> excuse me, Paul looked forward to mounting the steps of the Bema. With absolute confidence, he wrote, I am already being poured out as a drink offering, and the time of my departure, death is at hand. I have fought the good fight. I have finished the race. I have kept the faith. Finally, there is laid up for me the crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will give to me on that day. And not to me only, but also to all who have loved, loved his appearing. 2 Timothy 4, 6 to 8. To all who have longed for his appearing. So that includes all of us. May we face death with the same confidence with which the apostle faced his. As we anticipate receiving our reward. That's pretty tough, I know, for a young person to think about. But may we face that with confidence. Verses 12 to 15. Now, if anyone builds on the foundation with gold, silver, precious stones, wood, hay, straw, each one's work will become clear for the day will declare it because it will be revealed by fire and the fire will test each one's work of what sort it is. If anyone's work, which he has built on it, endures, he will receive a reward. If anyone's work is burned, he will suffer loss, but he himself will be saved, yet so as through fire. So the day to which Paul refers is a coming day of judgment for every Christian. Now, our commentator says, once again, let me stress that this judgment is not for the purpose of God's meeting out punishment, but rather for graciously conferring upon his servants our rewards. So we could think of it this way. I just got a, a DM from one of our young members today saying that they had graduated from one grade to another. So on graduate 
graduation day and let's presume grade 12, you know, high school's finished. Every high school or college grad receives his or her diploma. So each graduate enjoys the privileges that accompany his or her diploma or degree. But there's always those who receive extra honors conferred upon them for outstanding academic achievement. And so while everyone else in a graduation ceremony white wear a black tassel, the honored ones get to wear a gold one. Now I've never seen that because I've never attended a graduation where we were given a tassel. <clears throat> or at least maybe in college I did, but we didn't have separate ones. But they may wear gold ropes around their necks. And doctoral graduates sometimes get to wear fancy hoods with their, with their gowns. And the lowly master's grads had hoods too, but they were, are often not as grand as the doctoral candidates. But the difference in this case is that there will be no reason for us to strut our stuff on the BEMA because any rewards that me, we may receive are granted to us only by God's grace. So much like the scene in Revelation 4, 9 to 11, whenever the living creatures give glory and honor and thanks to him who sits on the throne, who lives forever and ever, the 24 elders fall down before him who sits on the throne and worship him who lives forever and ever and cast their crowns before the throne saying, you are worthy, O Lord, to receive glory and honor and power for you created all things and by your will they exist and were created. Now, if holy angels respond with such humility, how much more will we? We will probably look upon what God accomplished through such significantly flawed individuals as ourselves with equal wonder and humility. And maybe, just maybe, we too will cast our rewards before his throne in humble recognition that he alone deserves the praise for any achievements he may graciously reward. You see, I think today in our world, you know, we go along doing our own Bible studies. We have study Bibles. We have access to commentaries and all of these things. And there's nothing wrong with any of that. But I think sometimes we forget that God alone deserves the praise for any achievements that he may graciously award or reward in us. F.F. F. Bruce wrote this, the wisdom which created the worlds and maintains them in their due order may well beget in us a sense of wondering awe, but the grace which has provided a remedy for the defilement of sin by a life freely offered up to God on our behalf calls forth a sense of personal indebtedness, which the contemplation of divine activity on the cosmic scale could never evoke. Now see, Paul continued to milk the building metaphor when he compared our work to two categories of building materials. <clears throat> those of durable quality, gold, silver, precious stones, and those that easily decay, wood, hay, straw. And interestingly, I'm going to just throw this in there. There's a town in my province, in my country, that was pretty much raised last a year ago today due to a really bad forest fire. Almost everything was destroyed. But there's two homes being built, one on First Nations land or Indigenous land, a reserve, the other one is being built in town, but both of these houses are made off site and then rebuilt. But these are actually fire resistant homes, which I think is amazing. Now, we may or may not understand that fire is a common biblical metaphor used to symbolize God's judgment, a refiner's fire and here, God's 
discerning judgment. Again, this is judgment for the sake of rewards, not punishment. So for God's judgment, we could look at Matthew 25, 41. For refiner's fire, we could look at Revelation 3, 18. For judgment, we could look at 1 Peter 1, verses 17 and 18. So while Paul does not specifically detail the differences between works that are rewarded and those that are burned up, <coughs> excuse me, we can certainly surmise what he most likely intended to convey. For instance, Christ's servants who are motivated to do what they do by a lust for power, popularity, or prosperity will most likely see their works incinerated right before their eyes. Though they may have done good things and helped people, the errant motives may disqualify them from receiving any rewards because in the words of Jesus, I assuredly, I say to you, they have their reward. Matthew 6, 5. See, this Jesus spoke in reference to the power-hungry, applause-driven hypocrites who love to pray standing in the synagogues and on the street corners to be seen by men. I tell you the truth, they have received their reward in full. See, their rewards came in the form they sought their power over and recognition of the people they led. So did Paul include in this passage a not-so-gentle jab at the Corinthians? See, as a congregation, they were strategically placed in a world of hurt, a city whose spiritual needs cried out to the heavens. Yet they were so busy fighting amongst themselves that they were completely oblivious as to whom the real enemies were. In other words, the world, 1 John 2, 15, the flesh and the devil. So instead of standing against the decadence of downtown Corinth, they had become just like Corinth. Rather than resisting the pull of their flesh, they gave into their flesh, even to the point of committing open immorality and even getting drunk on the communion wine. I've heard of that, of people going and drinking the communion wine. And forgetting about striving against the devil, these Christians played right into his hands by allowing him to tear their fellowship apart at their seams. Their works would surely be burned to a crisp. Now here's a question for us. What about ours? Then we have verses 16 and 17. Do you not know that you are the temple of God and that the spirit of God dwells in you? If anyone defiles the temple of God, God will destroy him. For the temple of God is holy, which temple you are. See, Stephen got it right when he declared in the shadow of the temple, no less. In Acts 7, 48, the most high does not dwell in temples made with hands. God has chosen to dwell both within us and within the collective gathering of his people, which he calls the church. So when we get to 1 Corinthians 6, Paul's going to make the case that God dwells within us, since our bodies are the temple of the Holy Spirit who is in you. 1 Corinthians 6, 19. Here he states emphatically that God similarly dwells among us when we come together in corporate worship. So in that sense, a church be it the church in Corinth or the church we faithfully attend each week, it's God's temple. <clears throat> Lawrence O. Richards, or Dr. Larry Richards, who is the editor of these books, wrote this, only Christ's active support enables the universe and all processes in it to continue operation. You see, the Christians in Corinth were engaged in behaviors that were being used by the enemy to destroy Christ's witness in that desperately needy city. Hello, anybody see anything like that going on where you live? I know I sure do. In the eyes of God, theirs was not some minor infraction deserving a simple slap on the hand. This was a spiritual assault focused precisely 
on the one place of hope in an otherwise hopeless city. Those whose actions weakened and eventually destroyed the church will stand before God one day and give an account to him for what they did. And when they do, he will not be pleased. Then we go to verse 18 to the first part of 21. Let no one deceive himself. If anyone among you seems to be wise in this age, let him become a fool that he may become wise. For the wisdom of this world is foolishness with God. For it is written, he catches the wise in their own craftiness. And again, the Lord knows the thoughts of the wise, that they are futile. Therefore, let no one boast in men. So while it may seem strange that Paul would revisit a topic that he actually addressed two chapters ago, we have to remember that Paul was not writing a book by the standard chapter by chapter format to which we're accustomed. He wrote a letter, an intensely practical, sometimes pointed, and in some places personal letter to a church he founded and loved. And in reality, despite the arbitrary chapter divisions in our Bibles, he never actually left the topic of worldly wisdom and its devastating and divisive impact on a church. Paul warns those in Corinth that they ought not to allow themselves to be deceived into thinking that just because certain individuals hold positions of influence in a community, they automatically have the spiritual qualifications to lead the church. First and foremost, God looks for teachable humility in those who would lead his work. That's the essence of what Paul meant when he told the wise in this age to become a fool that he may, he may become truly wise. 1 Corinthians 3.18. And I'm here to tell you something. If you ever think that I'm prideful, if you ever think that I come across as being know-it-all, I need you to send me a DM because that is not my heart. I know that I don't know everything. My heart is to learn and to help lead others to Christ as God allows me the opportunity. And to punctuate his point, Paul quoted Job 5.13 and Psalm 94.11. And in both cases, God made clear that he is not impressed by a person's resume. What often impresses us means nothing to God. It's the old story. In 1 Samuel 16.7, the Lord said to Samuel, do not look at his appearance or at his physical stature because I have refused him. For the Lord does not see as man sees, for man looks at the outward appearance, but the Lord looks at the heart. Now, to be honest with you, I have seen many, 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 many pastors take positions within the church or even within the ministerial. And it's very interesting to see who the leadership often picks as their prominent members. Very interesting. Then we read in the latter part of verse 21 to 23 of 1 Corinthians 3, for all things are yours, whether Paul or Apollos or Cephas or the world or life or death or things present or things to come, all are yours. And you are Christ's and Christ is God's. So if Paul's final statement of 1 Corinthians 3 leaves us scratching our head as to its meaning, we're probably not alone. This is his passionate appeal for the church in Corinth to come back together in unity. We don't see it there. Well, the commentator has put it together into what's called the big picture. So understand this is not scripture. This is his take on it. Dear Christians in Corinth, please stop 
bragging about your achievements or those of the men you follow. We are not in competition with one another. Everything you have has been given to you by God as his special blessing to enrich your life. I, Paul, am just a humble servant whom God sent to you as a gift to bring the gospel message to your city. Apollos was a gift from God to teach you and establish you in your faith. Peter was a gift from God who preached the first gospel message ever and got the whole thing going. All of the beautiful sights and sounds this world has to offer are gifts from God for you to enjoy. Life itself is a gift from God for you to experience to the full. Even death is a blessing since it is a doorway to heaven where you will live with Jesus forever. Think about the many things you can be thankful for right now, right here in the present. Look to the future and all of the blessings that God will shower upon you tomorrow. You are blessed people who are joined together as one with Christ, just as Christ is one with God. Now, put your petty little differences aside and start acting like it. Father, how accurate this big picture is, I don't know. Your word says, for all things are yours, whether Paul or Apollos or Cephas or the world or life or death or things present or things to come, all are yours. And you are Christ's and Christ is God's. And I pray, Father, that when we look at each other, when we look at ourselves, that we would realize that we are bought and paid for by the blood of Christ. And that everything that he is and has and does is yours. And that makes us yours. We are your children. We are sons and daughters of the most high God. If there's any pride that gets in our way, then I pray, God, that you would remove it in the holy name of Jesus. I pray, Father, that if we get to feeling badly about ourselves or uncertain about our faith, that you would do what you did with the church in Corinth and that you would teach us, that you would lead us, that you would guide us, that you would change our hearts and our minds to receive what you would have for us. And when we face difficulties, when we face sin, when we face temptation that would lead us away from you, then I ask, Father, that you would speak to our hearts and our minds and our lives, that you would use us to bring about your purposes. Because that's really why we're here. Thank you for the Lighthouse Discord server. Thank you for the opportunity of sharing your word. And as we go into yet another holiday weekend for the Americas, Lord, I pray your blessing upon each one. In Jesus' holy name we pray. Amen.